Is there an omega plan at work here? Are we seeing a plan, an end time plan being played out that our country was specifically designed to be the agency to bring it about? I began to wonder about that, so I started putting together a timeline of events. Now, I didn't go very far back. I'm sure I could have gone a lot further back than I did. I just went back to an interesting date, September 11, 1990, when Daddy Bush announced his plan for a new world order. And it just so happened a few years to the day, you know, we had another event that happened. In between that, we have in 1999, Zahi Hawass discovers the tomb of Osiris. And then we have September 11th, 2001, when Junior Bush just so happened to be in office. And one of the greatest tragedies our nation has had took place. And I believe without a doubt, it was an inside job. And it, here it is 15 years later. If you still haven't figured that out yet, please, you know, dig yourself out of the sand, you know, pull your head out of wherever it may be uh, and do some research. Okay, seriously. It's time we realize what really happened on that day. Isolated pockets of fire. Two water lines to knock them down. FEMA's executive summary relays that much of the fuel in the planes, jet-grade kerosene, was consumed by the initial fireballs and the following few minutes of fire. The Twin Towers were composed of 200,000 tons of steel and 425,000 cubic yards of concrete. The core of each tower was a rectangular pillar, 87 by 133 feet comprised of 47 steel box columns ranging from 36 by 16 to 52 by 22 inches. An analysis released in 1964 claims that the buildings were investigated and found to be safe in an assumed collision with a 707 traveling at 600 miles per hour. Such collision would result in only local damage which could not cause collapse or substantial damage to the building. Inside there was the core a rectangle of 47 columns made of four inch thick steel at the base, thinning with increasing height. The cores combined might with ingenuity. The story we were told, this rock-like steel grid gave way because fire warped the trusses, causing the bolts to fail. As the trusses sagged and fell, the floors dropped with them. In its 2002 documentary, Why the Towers Fell, PBS creates a video model. Once the trusses fail, the floors they were holding cascade down with a force too great to be withstood. The result is what's called a progressive collapse, as each floor pancakes down onto the one below. What remains standing? The tall, indestructible core. Why does PBS fail to explain the complete disappearance of the Twin Towers' cores? Since the black smoke coming from the buildings means that the fire was oxygen starved and could not have reached its maximum temperature of 1800 degrees Fahrenheit, and steel melts at a much higher temperature of 2500 degrees Fahrenheit, nearly 700 degrees hotter than the maximum temperature of the fire, how could cleanup crews have found melted steel in the basements? Why did Fire Engineering Magazine tell us that no steel building has ever been destroyed by fire? That the World Trade Center investigation was a half-baked farce? How do these firefighters describe the collapse of the North Tower? We started running. Floor by floor, it started popping out. It was, like, it was if, if they had detonated. Yeah, you know, detonated. They were planned yeah. to take down a building. Boom, 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 boom. All the way down. Chief Albert Turry told me that there was another explosion which took place. So according to his theory, he thinks that there were actually devices that were planted in the building almost looks like one of those planned implosions. As if a demolition team set off, when you see the old demolitions yes, of these old buildings, it My pulled God. it down on itself and it is My not God. there anymore. Generally speaking, for a building to collapse in on itself like that, it would seem to indicate that there could have been an explosion, a bomb planted on the ground that would make the building collapse within itself. By that evening, eyewitnesses and experts alike were rushing to defend the official narrative of events claiming that raging jet fuel fires 
melted the steel inside the Twin Towers. I saw this plane come out of nowhere and just ream right into the side of the Twin Tower, exploding through the other side. And then I witnessed both towers collapse, one first and then the second, mostly due to structural failure because the fire was just too intense. Marlene Davis is the Dean of Architecture at the University of Tennessee. She calls the 110-story tall twin tower tube structures. That means there are no internal columns holding it up. You know, when we saw this yesterday, people said, oh my goodness, there was a bomb on there. There must have been a bomb that must collapsed. must have been a bomb below right. that, that, that finished the job. Well, it turns out we heard from uh, experts who said that, you know what, the, the fire on those floors, probably 1,500 degrees. Steel can only withstand so much because the steel structure that holds the building up was on the outside and essentially the building started to melt and it gave way and it toppled steel will melt no steel building has ever been destroyed by fire just who was behind the terror attacks larry silverstein became landlord on july 24th less than two months before the attack he then had control of the maintenance and security departments and he began to replace security personnel. Silverstein brought Frank Lowy into the deal to become landlord of the underground shopping mall. Lowy is a billionaire who owns shopping malls in several nations. After the towers disintegrated, Silverstein demanded insurance companies pay him twice what the policy stated, on the grounds that each tower underwent separate attacks. What a coincidence that after these guys got control of the World Trade Center, Osama bin Laden decided to destroy the entire complex. CBS's Jim Stewart in Washington has been tracking events all day and has the latest, Jim. We're told rescue workers have recovered a passport and the debris. It belonged to one of the dead hijackers. Another development on Saturday. New York officials revealed at a news conference here in the city that a hijacker's passport was found blocks from the World Trade Center crash site, if you can believe that. Well, Dan, not far from here, a passerby found the passport of one of the hijackers. Evidence this disaster scene is also a crime scene. These passports are so magical and so wonderful that like Gollum's ring, they call to you. They call to who they want to find them, but not any normal mortal. No, 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 no. The ring calls out only to FBI agents. The 9-11 Commission says the CVRs and FDRs from American 11 and United 175 were not found. Yet, the FBI claims to have found the passport of Satam al sakami which managed to fly out of his pocket through the explosion and onto the streets of Manhattan below. So, four different black boxes, made from the most resilient materials known to man, were destroyed. Yet, a passport, made from a fragile material known as paper, managed to survive? Who writes this stuff? In 2006, during the trial of Zacharias Massawi, the FBI managed to provide a multitude of evidence that appears to have survived a catastrophic crash in near pristine condition. Among the exhibits were a red bandana and a Kingdom of Saudi Arabia driver's license. Although a 757 managed to obliterate itself upon impact, paper and fabric managed to survive without a scratch. A six-month investigation by the Senate Intelligence Committee concluded in December 2006 that Abel Danger did not identify Muhammad Atta or any other 9-11 hijacker. Can we be certain that the hijackers were radical Muslims on a suicide mission? Or is there a possibility that they were trained, funded, and protected in our own country? Where is this mysterious chart that reportedly says that Otto was connected in some real way to these other hijackers. We'd love to see it. The company responsible for the chart, Orion Scientific Systems, would claim that only two charts were produced and that Otto was not present on either one. These charts were all done by the data mining efforts. So the Orion Corporation lied to the Senate Judiciary Committee staff. All data mining efforts, and yet the company said to the Senate Judiciary staff, we don't have any of those charts, they're not ours. Well, here they are and their logos are on each one of them. And last but not least, Mohammed Atta's father claimed to receive a phone call from his son on September 12th. 
On September 20th and 27th, Mueller admitted on CNN that there is no legal proof to prove the identities of the hijackers. So if there's no proof that the hijackers were members of Al-Qaeda, or if they were even on the plane in the first place, what justification do we have for bombing Afghanistan? Why 9-11? Why, why is it that specific day? Well, I showed you Revelation 9-11. That's a pretty good indicator. But I'm going to suggest there may be another one why that is a target date. And it relates to the birth of our Savior. Amen. I believe our Savior was born on September 11th. I believe he was born, and I know this is, people have different views on this. Some say the Feast of Tabernacles. I've heard all the arguments. Mark Biltz makes a really good case for that. Um, but I believe that he was born in the Feast of Trumpets, mainly because of this verse right here. This verse is a stellar alignment in Revelation chapter 12, 1 through 5. And uh, it talks about a, a woman arrayed with the sun, the, the moon at her feet, and, and the stars at her head and all that. This exact alignment happened on September 11th, 3 BC. And to explain that a little bit more, I got a little clip here from Dr. Michael Heiser talking about this. The signs and symbols that are used in Revelation 12 are well known to astronomical symbols. Here's a superimposed picture over it. Now we have Scorpio and Libra, the scales, but in the ancient times, this was one known as the dragon. Uh, you have a very small window of time where all of these things can be present at the same time, and where everything is accounted for. The sun was clothing the woman, the king star, king planet in Leo, the sign for the tribe of Judah. All of these things did occur in a year that fits well for Jesus' birth, and that is 3 B.C. And the real sort of interesting thing about 3 B.C. is is since this concatenation of signs uh, can only occur in an 80 minute window, we know exactly uh, the date of the birth of the Messiah in 3 BC, and that date is September 11th. You can confirm this for yourself. There's some software called Stellarium. You can download for free, stellarium.org, I believe is the website. And uh, the this interesting thing about the software, though, because the whole year, there's no year zero scenario. Uh, the way they reckon 3 BC is negative 2 in the software. So if you, and w if you really want to get technical with it, you can set your, lo your viewing location in the software. So set your viewing location to uh, Babylon. So that's where I believe the Magi were when they saw the, the sign. Uh, so set your location to Babylon. Ba I, I would suggest you back this, the uh, date off to about August 28th, negative 2. August 28th, negative two. And then there's, a, there's an option for you to step forward so you can watch each day's advancement happen. And you'll see a really amazing dance of the stars that takes place that leads up to that alignment all coming together in perfect harmony for 80 minutes, which I believe was a time period that Mary was probably in labor giving birth, for 80 minutes on September 11th, 3 BC. It's extraordinary. Uh, but the moon at her feet is the giveaway. The moon at her feet is a new moon, which rules out tabernacles. Tabernacles is a, is a full moon. So, um, and the other problem is a lot of people, one of the anecdotal references for Tabernacles is, well, he came and tabernacled among us and all that. Well, that wouldn't work either because when a male is born, the woman has, there's a seven days of uncleanliness where they have to be isolated in their time of uncleanness, you know, and all that. And then, of course, on the eighth day, he circumcised. Well, he couldn't have been tabernacling among us because he would have been away with Mary in her time of seven days of uncleanness. The other problem is that that's one of three feasts where the males are all commanded by God to be in Jerusalem. Not a good way for the sinless land to <laughs> lamb to enter the world in violation of the commandment with both his stepfather, J Joseph, and him not in Jerusalem during that time because they're in Bethlehem. So, you know, just reading Revelation chapter 12 and looking at Stellarium, that was a slam dunk for me. And then seeing the phase of the moon, where, you know, what, what phase of the moon is, I'm like, and, and that works out better because if he's born in trumpets, uh, which is also known as the day that kings were coordinated, co coordinated. So, you know, and I believe that the earthly feasts represent things that take place in heaven. So while heavenly trumpets are going off, earthly trumpets are going off as the true king of kings and lord of lords is being born on the day that kings are being coordinated. Uh, and then you have the period of seven days. Then you have his eighth day circumcision. You have day of atonement and then everything's good to go. Let's go to Jerusalem. And then they were able to legitimately tabernacle among everybody for the Feast of Tabernacles. 
So that's that's. Uh, this first appeared in scholarly journals uh, in 1976. I can't remember the guy's name. It was Dr. Ernest somebody, uh, but that information was out there a long time ago. Yeah. Publicly. Yeah. It. It, I guess it's been around for a while, but it's only recently kind of resurfaced. Of course, yeah. uh, at about the same time as everybody suddenly started paying attention to the feast anyway. Mm-hmm. It used to be, ah, oh, that's the feast of the Jews. You know, but now, you know, a, a lot of Christians are realizing, hey, that stuff's for us too, and uh, people are getting more intentional about uh, uh, checking that stuff out. So if that's true, then, you know, we have a big problem with the, uh, among other problems, with the December 25th deal. Because <laughs> you know, I believe he's coming back on his birthday. Well, yeah, it's, you know, the Jeremiah 10 and all that. I mean, yeah, for sure. Uh, but the, the feasts, they are moedim in Hebrew. That, that means appointed times. That we are supposed to mikra. In Hebrew, mikra, that means rehearse. They, they are times that we're supposed to rehearse. Well, I've been in theater since 1986. Why do we rehearse? We rehearse to get it right. <laughs> so that when the curtain opens and it's the main event, we all know our lines, we know our, know our marks, and the play goes out the way it's supposed to. Well, if this is the divine script, and Yahuwah is the author of this divine script, then the main character is Yeshua, and he knows his lines perfectly, and he hits his mark every time, and he does so on the Moedim, on the appointed times. So we know that he came, he died on Passover, right? He was buried on unleavened bread. I personally believe he rose on Shabbat, just before the end of Shabbat. Uh, whatever the case may be, we have uh, the first fruits right after that. And then the Holy Spirit comes down on Pentecost. So he hit all the marks perfectly in his first coming. So it stands to reason he's going to hit the remaining marks perfectly as well. So we should be practicing, if you believe, we're in the last days. <laughs> and if you want to celebrate his birth, nothing wrong with that. No, no command in Scripture to do so. But, I mean, it's a good thing. He came into the world. That's awesome. Let's rejoice. Cool, let's do it on the day he was actually born. <laughs> now, if you want to do it on an actual physical calendar date, that's tomorrow <laughs> on our current calendar. I understand the issues of the calendar. I'll go crazy. Uh, but with our current <laughs> Gregorian pagan calendar that we're using, I'm going to be saying happy birthday, Jesus, tomorrow on Facebook just to get everybody riled up. <laughs> <laughs> while preparing to celebrate during Feast of Trumpets, which, of course, on the Gregorian calendar slides, you know, uh, on the Gregorian calendar. But what a strategic thing for the enemy to do. Get us all to celebrate Christ the King. Oh, by the way, Christ is a generic word. Cyrus, pagan Cyrus King, is a, was a Messiah. It just means anointed one. Anointed one. Somebody's anointed. There are a lot of Christs, Right? So when we're singing happy birthday to Christ the King, born this day on December 25th, I'm raising my hand going, wait, who are we talking about here? (laughs) We're talking about an anointed king, but we're not talking about Yeshua, the Son of God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So who are we singing to on December 25th then with a big phallic symbol in our living room? (laughs) That's what it is. And we have them set up in our churches. And we point to Jeremiah chapter 10, and then people say, that's talking about idolatry. Well, hello. It says, the people go out to the field, cut down a tree, stand it upright, and deck it with silver and gold. (laughs) (laughs) They cut a tree, bring it home, deck it with silver and gold, and then bow down before it to lay presents, and then bow down before it to receive presents. Sure looks like idolatry to me, setting up as a centerpiece in your living room. And this is coming from a guy who loved Christmas. One of my favorite things to do is lay under the Christmas tree and watch the lights dancing on the ceiling, smelling the pine. I love that stuff. Wow. But can you imagine singing it's the most wonderful time of the year now on September 11th? In this country? Ah, strategic, wasn't it? Yeah, pretty crazy. I'm going to play a video for you. It's about 20 minutes long now. Uh, that basically summarizes 20 years worth of time in 20 minutes. I call it the Omega Plan. This video, if you're interested, is actually... What's the matter? It didn't work? Yeah, it wasn't. Hook that in. Okay. That'll put that into your thing. That, that'll, that'll work for sure. Okay. Um, it didn't work. It just was real loud. Okay. Um, just as you're watching this video, keep in mind all the things that we just talked about. Right? All the stuff I just shared with you Keep all that in mind when you're watching this video. What is at stake is more than one small country. It is a big idea, a new world order. 
He talks so much about dispelling myths. How about confirming one? What is this? Susie, this is the tomb of Osiris. The god of the underworld. This once extravagant mausoleum, a moat with four pillars engraved with hieroglyphics constructed thousands of years ago, was intended to be a shrine for the keeper of the afterlife. Polls have just now closed in six additional states representing 66 electoral votes. We must follow no other course. Now it is a seed upon the wind, taking root in many nations. We will confront weapons of mass destruction. We will build our defenses beyond challenge, lest weakness invite challenge. This work continues. The story goes on. And an angel still rides in the whirlwind and directs this storm. Another plane just hit the World Trade Center. Wait, oh my God, oh my God, the building fell. We have no idea what caused this. Let us never tolerate outrageous conspiracy theories concerning the attacks of September the 11th. Malicious lies that attempt to shift the blame away from the terrorists themselves, away from the guilty. On the morning of September 11th, 2001, 19 men armed with box cutters directed by a man on dialysis in a cave fortress halfway around the world using a satellite phone and a laptop directed the most sophisticated penetration of the most heavily defended airspace in the world. Overpowering the passengers and the military combat trained pilots on four commercial aircraft before flying those planes wildly off course for over an hour without being molested by a single fighter interceptor. These 19 hijackers, devout religious fundamentalists who like to drink alcohol, snort cocaine and live with pink haired strippers managed to knock down three buildings with two planes in New York. While in Washington, a pilot who couldn't handle a single-engine Cessna was able to fly a 757 in an 8,000-foot descending 270-degree corkscrew turn to come exactly level with the ground, hitting the Pentagon in the budget analyst office where DOD staffers were working on the mystery of the $2.3 trillion that Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld had announced missing from the Pentagon's coffers in a press conference the day before, on September 10, 2001. Luckily, the news anchors knew who did it within minutes. Osama bin Laden. The pundits knew within hours. Osama bin Laden. The administration knew within the day terrorists who committed these acts and those who harbored them. And the evidence literally fell into the FBI's lap. That a hijacker's passport was found blocks from the World Trade Center crash site, if you can believe that. But for some reason, a bunch of crazy conspiracy theorists demanded an investigation into the greatest attack on American soil in history. That investigation was delayed, underfunded, set up to fail, a conflict of interest, and a cover-up from start to finish. It was based on testimony extracted through torture, the records of which were destroyed. It failed to mention the existence of WTC-7, Able Danger, p -Tech, Sibel Edmonds, OBL and the CIA, and the drills of hijacked aircraft being flown into buildings that were being simulated at the precise same time that those events were actually happening. It was lied to by the Pentagon, the CIA, the Bush administration, and as for Bush and Cheney, well, no one knows what they told it because they testified in secret, off the record, not under oath, and behind closed doors. It didn't bother to look at who funded the attacks, because that question is ultimately of little practical significance. Still, the 9-11 Commission did brilliantly answering all of the questions the public had, except most of the victim's family members' questions, and pinned blame on all the people responsible, although no one so much as lost their job, determining the attacks were failure of imagination. Because... Nobody our government, at least, and I don't think the prior government that could envision flying airplanes into buildings. Except the Pentagon, FEMA, NORAD, and the NRO. The DIA destroyed 2.5 terabytes of data on Able Danger, but that's okay because it probably wasn't important. NIST has classified the data that they used for their model of WTC-7's collapse, but that's okay because knowing how they made their model of the collapse would jeopardize public safety. Osama bin Laden lived in a cave fortress in the hills of Afghanistan, but somehow got away. Then he was hiding out in Tora Bora, but somehow got away. Then he lived in Abbottabad for years, taunting the most comprehensive intelligence dragnet employing the most sophisticated technology in the history of the world for a decade, releasing video after video with complete impunity and getting younger and younger as he did so, before finally being found in a daring SEAL team raid which wasn't recorded on video, in which he didn't resist or use his wife as a human shield, and in which these crack special forces operatives panicked and killed this unarmed man, supposedly the best source of intelligence about those dastardly terrorists on the entire planet. Then they dumped his body in the ocean before telling anyone about it. Then a couple dozen of that team's members died in a helicopter crash in Afghanistan. You will never ever express doubts about any part of this story to anyone. 
ever. Imagine the startling proposition that the Nephilim, the giants, the mighty men of old, the gods and children of the Watchers could somehow rise up, could somehow be reconstituted inside of a body. And, of course, I've discussed with you before my theory that one of the greatest legends in history could be a record of that having actually happened. And I'm referring to Nimrod, who some scholars also identify as Gilgamesh of Sumerian fame, Apollo of Greek fame, Osiris of Egyptian fame. And this Gilgamesh was a giant who a lot of people didn't even believe was anything more than myth until his grave marker was found a few years back. And then, according to some people, the military swooped in and took possession and control of that dig. Hey, Tom, I want to interject something. I talked to a special operations general who was there when Gilgamesh's remains, and in his words, were he was in a state of remarkable preservation, okay? He said they have Gilgamesh's remains. So if they have Gilgamesh and he is Nimrod, they got it. And the whole point was to extract the DNA. When the Iraqi regime fell in April 2003, the Iraqi museum in Baghdad and museums in other provinces such as Mosul, Basra and Babur were exposed to theft for two consecutive days. The theft was carried out by local and international networks as well as Iraqi and Arab agents. It is estimated that 170,000 artifacts were stolen, 15,000 of which have no registration records. The most important of these artifacts are the Sumerian cuneiforms, which represents the philosophy of life and death. Many date back to Mesopotamian times more than 4,000 years ago. Artifacts pertaining to the civilizations of the Sumerians, Babylonians, and Chaldeans, and others that go back thousands of years in history, were taken away from the land of the two rivers. In addition, entire book collections from certain historic eras disappeared from the National Library, thus negatively affecting Iraq's wealth of civilization and culture. One must also mention that some artifacts were stolen and sent to Israel via the American forces. But American troops stood by as Iraq's heritage was plundered. One memorable moment that week was when Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld dismissed the looting in Baghdad as unimportant. Freedom's untidy, and free people are free to make mistakes and commit crimes and do bad things. Many of the looters knew which objects they were looking for and where to find them. In other words, they were insiders. Investigations revealed that the main metal gate of the storage rooms was opened. It was not opened by force, which means a person who knew where the key was participated in the theft. J.P. Morgan Chase Bank led a 13-bank consortium to establish the Central Bank of Iraq. De La Rue was brought in to print up the new Iraqi dinar. This currency has some of the most anti-counterfeit measures of any other currency on the planet, and yet it is completely worthless. Its current value is approximately 1163 to 1 U.S. dollar. But from 1982 until about 1993, one dinar was worth $3.22. There are secrets that George W. Bush guards at least as carefully as any entrusted to a president. Secrets he's forbidden to share even with the vice president. Secrets he's held ever since his days at Yale, where in his senior year, like his father and his grandfather, he belonged to Skull and Bones, the elite secret society whose members include some of the most powerful men of the 20th century. President Bush has tapped five fellow Bonesmen to join his administration. Most recently, the head of the Securities and Exchange Commission, William Donaldson, Skull and Bones, 1953. Bones is not restricted to Republicans. Yet another Bonesman has his eye on the Oval Office. Senator John Kerry, Democrat, Skull and Bones, 1966. You both were members of Skull and Bones, a secret society at Yale. What does that tell us? Uh, not much, because it's a secret. <laughs> Is there a secret handshake? Is there a secret code? I wish there were something secret I could manifest. 322? Secret number? Uh, there are all kinds of secrets, Tim, but one thing is not a secret. I disagree with this president's direction that he's taking the country. We can do a better job, and I intend to do it. You were both in Skull and Bones, the secret society. It's so secret we can't talk about it. What does that mean for America? The conspiracy theorists are going to go watch. I'm sure they are. I don't know. I haven't seen the rest of Number 322? <laughs> uh, first of all, he's not the nominee. And, uh, but, uh, 
Look, I look for. Are you prepared to lose? No, I'm not going to lose. Saddam, 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 Saddam Hussein. War and danger. Continuing danger. Hour of danger. Very, very dangerous world. The evil terrorists. 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 Dramatic changes now beginning to occur. John Kerry with 77 electoral votes and George Bush with 66. These men are like this. The only thing that unifies them are skull and bones. Skull and bones will still keep control of the presidency. By our efforts, we have lit a fire as well. A fire in the minds of men. It warms those who feel its power. It burns those who fight its progress. And one day, this untamed fire of freedom will reach the darkest corners of our world. The Bible says that Iraq, which was known in the Bible days as Babylon, will not only emerge in the last days, it will emerge as the wealthiest, most peaceful, most powerful nation on the face of the planet. So the question is, how do we get from the chaos that there has been over the last few years to the wealthiest country on the planet in the last days? Something must get better. Right. So people ask me, are we right. making Iraq safe for the Antichrist or safe for democracy? And right. it's a little bit of both. We cannot continue to rely only on our military in order to achieve the national security objectives that we've set. We've got to have a civilian national security force that's just as powerful, just as strong, just as well-funded. And those who tell us that we can't, we will respond with that timeless creed that sums up the spirit of a people. Yes, we can. And if you say, with profound gratitude and great humility, I accept your nomination for presidency of the United States. All across America, something is stirred. It's been a whirlwind of activity. Uh, these first hundred days. Finally, I believe that my next hundred days will be so successful I will be able to complete them in 72 days. <laughs> and on the 73rd day, I will rest. What did uh, the president and the pope uh, talk about this morning? The Vatican positions, you know, don't fall into the usual left and right of American politics. The pope, for example, is for stronger world government. He just issued an encyclical, a sort of Vatican position paper, calling for much stronger regulation of the financial world. And at the same time, of course, the Pope is opposed to abortion and stem cell research, which Mr. Obama favors. E pluribus unum. That was Latin. That's what's inscribed on a quarter. Out of many, one. Of course, the visual highlight was the president touring the pyramids outside and in. Purification, mummification, self identification. That looks like me. Look at those ears. <laughs> Separated at birth from a hieroglyphic, but the president's guide saw another resemblance. Mr. President, you look like King Tut. I've been told. Yes, it's true. He should know about King Tut. Dr. Sahi Hawass oversaw scans of Tut's mummy that produced this likeness. The president's trip inspired Egyptians to display decorations calling Obama the new King Tut of the world. But even the new King Tut couldn't budge a pyramid. Still, it's good practice for trying to push peace in the Mideast. Scientists from all over the world are trying to figure out what caused a mysterious blue light to spiral in the sky over Norway on Wednesday. Early yesterday morning, just before dawn, this appeared in the Norwegian sky. A blue light, small at first, growing into a spiral, and then disappearing into what appeared to be a black hole. Thousands of Norwegians bombarded the Meteorological Institute to ask what that light could have possibly been. Some feared it could have been a meteor, others a black hole, and there are even those that thought it could be aliens. December 21st, 2010, I looked up and I saw a decapitated blood red head, looked like, floating over the shoulders of Orion at 2.22 in the morning. Oh, by the way, 2.22 in the morning Central Standard Time is 3.22 in the morning Eastern Standard Time. 3.22 is the coveted number of the Skull and Bone Society, of which the whole Bush family has been strongly associated with, as was Carrie. Two Illuminist, 3.22. What's that? A skull? A decapitated head on top of a pile of bones? 
322, what was happening in Iraq at that very moment? Iraq had just announced the foundation of its newly formed government. And the entire planet, you could look this up for yourself, shook. The, the seismographic monitors that checked earthquake activity around the world, every one of them went into the black that night. What's going on? I don't know. After nearly nine years, our war in Iraq ends this month. Today, I'm proud to welcome Prime Minister Maliki, the elected leader of a sovereign, self-reliant, and democratic Iraq. In the coming years, it's estimated that Iraq's economy will grow even faster than China's or India's. Here's my dinars. I got them. Well, you know, look, I'm I from can't... the Trade Bank of Iraq, the only ATM in the country. Now, I, look, this is a country oh, that's resource-based that right. obviously um, has tremendous aid by the U.S., but could be very self-sufficient with all these oil uh, companies that we've been talking about that are exploring, that are exploring, they're about to explore there. And so I told my viewer, look, I can't fight it. I would like to know how best to get it. And it would really be great if, you know, these guys set up these ETFs all the time. How about an ETF right. to play the dinar? That would really be the best way to go. For the first time in two decades, Iraq is scheduled to host the next Arab League summit. And what a powerful message that will send throughout the Arab world. And finally, we're partnering for regional security. For just as Iraq has pledged not to interfere in other nations, other nations must not interfere in Iraq. Iraq's sovereignty must be respected. And let us never forget those who gave us this chance. The untold number of Iraqis who've given their lives. More than one million Americans, military and civilian, who have served in Iraq. Nearly 4,500 fallen Americans gave their last full measure of devotion. Tens of thousands of wounded warriors, and so many inspiring military families. People ask me, are we right. making Iraq safe for the Antichrist or safe for democracy? And right. it's a little bit of both. This is an extraordinary achievement. Nearly nine years in the making. We're building a new partnership between our nations. America continues to maintain a high presence in the country, with the largest U.S. embassy in the world located in the capital, Baghdad, with 15,000 members of staff. Before they leave, U.S. forces will have to transfer dozens of bases to the Iraqis and dispose of or ship out thousands of vehicles. Sometimes it's too cumbersome to bring a lot of this equipment back to the U.S., so a lot of it's left on bases. We're leaving over 500 military bases to the Iraqis, both to the Iraqi security forces and also to the government. This is a happy occasion for all of us. It is considered one of the most important days for the Iraqi army and Iraqis, which is the day of handing over Sania base from the friendly side to the Iraqi army. The journey that basically led me to standing here today really got started on December 21st, 2010. I mentioned it in the video there. Uh, my wife were, and I were out for a walk earlier in the morning, we're late nighters, and at 2.22 in the morning I look up and I see the blood, the, the moon turning blood red, uh, looking like a decapitated head floating over the shoulders of Orion for 72 minutes. <laughs> And, you know, having done a lot of the research on 72 and Nimrod and all that stuff already, and I'm looking up and seeing this, I said, honey, we got to get back. I don't know what's going on here, but this is, uh, this is serious. So I, I got back home, and the thought occurs to me that, wow, 222, our time, Central Standard Time, was 322 Eastern Standard Time, of course, the whole skull and bones and all that deal, uh, and 72 minutes being a high occult number looking up some stuff online and seeing that Iraq had just announced its fully formed government. It was nighttime here, daytime there. That's what's going on over there as this is happening here. Nimrod is a stellar representation. The occult usurped, the, I believe, in the Gospel of the Stars. If you ever read the Gospel of the Stars or the Witness of the Stars, the original intense, intended meaning of Orion is the Redeemer. It's Yeshua. But it was, it was stolen, basically, usurped by... Uh, the occult and it became known as Osiris and as Nimrod the mighty hunter um, you know so all that symbolism is there Nimrod the founder of Babylon his stellar alignment head is coming back into place as his government says hey we're back in business again over there and this is what really got me because I started researching as soon as I got home I had like 50 browser windows open I'm checking all kinds of stuff and I stumble across this guy Dutch senses his uh, 
uh, YouTube channel. He checks earthquake activity and harp activity and stuff like that. And he's freaking out live on the air. Like, I don't know what's going on, folks, but like all the internet seismic servers that check earthquake activity right now, they're all going in the black. And that shot that I showed in the video was, I recorded that live. He's, the whole world's shaking at that moment. And then right after that, we have massive fish and bird die-offs. Do you guys remember that? It was like front page news for a little while and then it dropped off the page, but you know, it, it was happening quite frequently. I mean, all these birds and it was breed specific. It wasn't like a whole bunch of hodgepodge of birds. It was like one specific breed of bird dying by the hundreds and one specific breed of fish washing up by the hundreds of thousands and millions and stuff. I mean, it was really bizarre, all that taking place. And then they say, hey, we need to add a 13th sign to the Zodiac. And they had Ophiuchus, who was Asclepius. And in the mythology, Asclepius was known for raising people from the dead, specifically Orion. He got so good at it that he began to empty the domain Hades such that the entity Hades got upset about it. So he tells his brother Zeus, hey, you got to do something about this guy. He's emptying my place down here. So Zeus says, okay, fine. He takes Asclepius, throws him up into the sky, and he becomes Ophiuchus, the constellation, according to mythology. So he's known for emptying Hades and raising Orion from the dead, and that's the 13th sign that they add to the Zodiac. All of that happened right around this time period very shortly after December 21st, 2010. Remember everybody was talking about December 21st, 2012? The Aztec calendar stone, the mine, all that stuff? I believe our calendars are off by two years. Remember what I said about September 11th, 3 BC? In the software on the Gregorian calendar, it's reckoned as negative two. Subtract two years from December 21st, 2012, and you end up with this. This went completely under the radar Nobody was paying attention. I, you know, I just happened to be at the right place at the right time to see what I saw and then go, go down the rabbit trail that followed. But can you imagine if all of this would have happened right after December 21st, 2012? Everybody, their dog and a talking parrot would be out there on the speaking circuit talking about this stuff. No, I believe that the software tells you Yeshua was born on September, 21st, or September 11th, 3 BC, reckoned as negative two, two years off. I think that's what they were, the ancients saw. Just speculation. So what are we talking about here? Are we talking about the return of this guy? Uh, you be the judge. Looks like it to me, though. At least all the circumstantial evidence seems to be pointing that way. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video presentation. If you did, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, like the video, and share it on your favorite social media sites. There's a lot more to come, so stay tuned, and we'll see you back next time.